What it do? Welcome to another new episode of Locked On Bucks, where we continue the conversation that we were having with Ty Windish yesterday about some of the youngsters on the Bucks roster and what we might be able to expect for them in this upcoming season or in years beyond that. So get ready for another new episode of Locked On Bucks. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Camille Davis. You can catch me weekly on the Technical File Podcast and the Pack a Day Pod. Joining me in this episode is Justin Garcia, other co-host of Locked On Bucks, voice of the Bucks Radio Network, and our special guest, Ty Windish from the Eurostep Podcast and GSPN. As I mentioned yesterday... A big conversation that we could not just keep on one day. Had to make this a two-parter. We appreciate you tuning in for both parts, especially during the off-season here. Appreciate you. Thank you for making Locked on Bucks your first listen every single day. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts as well as on YouTube. So sit back and enjoy uh, the rest of the conversation between myself, Justin, and Ty as we talk all things Young Bucks. Um, but I do think this summer is just so big, like these workouts, training camp, preseason, summer league. We'll see how many guys go to summer league from from this group. But uh, just to kind of show where everyone's at as we go into next season. Um, but, yeah, I think I, I was almost at a point at one point this season where I was like, maybe you just move from Marjan here. Maybe the opportunity is just not right. But the way Doc spoke about him, uh, Rohan and I on our show both came around of like, keep him around. Let's see what happens because this guy could pop like any of these guys could pop and you don't want to be in this Dante situation again, even though that's more nuanced, more complicated, but you don't want Marjan to be looking incredible for the Knicks in the playoffs. Next season. It's, it's more complicated. It still um, doesn't feel great to see that Serge Ibaka was your return, but Man, I think yeah. that's the other piece when you, you had a chance to watch him at the G league. He's one of those guys that, um, I mean, you see it a lot with baseball when you hear about four, a players. I don't know if he's there, I think he's clearly far too skilled to be a G League player, but he's just not – he hasn't put it together yet, whether that's development or injuries. He's not quite fully reliable NBA rotational player as of last season. That could change this summer and next season. That's the hope. I think that's what we all – like at least one of them has – like if one of the young guys at the very least can be a bona fide rotational piece – for the Bucks, that's a success, given the fact that there's like four, possibly five uh, that will be on this roster. You hope it's more than one, uh, just given the fact, again, the Bucks need some athleticism. We've been talking about that throughout the year, especially if they can play some defense, which brings me to Andre Jackson Jr., somebody who I said when he was drafted, he is somebody who Mike Budenholzer would have probably never have drafted because – of what we knew about his uh, shooting ability. And that just didn't fit in, but he has the tools. He is a great defender. He has all the tools for that. He's good facilitating. We saw that in co the college level with him in UConn and just kind of running the offense a little bit at times there. And I think part of his NBA transition that uh, was difficult for him was having to learn how to be off ball most of the time where in college he was somebody uh, who had the ball a lot could initiate. But one thing that jumped off the, the screen when watching Andre Jackson Jr. is the athleticism, is just the effort, how he comes out there super hot, ready to go. Sometimes it led to fouls, which some of them were like, OK, you got to you got to reel that in. And some of them I thought were just he's a rookie. He's not going to get the benefit of the doubt from the referee's whistle. Um, and we saw him under grip, saw him under dock. And we saw him have some big moments in that Pacers series as well. So. Well, looking at Andre Jackson Jr.'s game and what you saw with him down at the her level, uh, what do you think we might see from him going into next season for the Milwaukee Bucks? Yeah, it was actually interesting because I agreed. I thought being off ball more was going to be – I don't think it was an adjustment for him at the NBA level. And then it almost was like an adjustment back, going to be on ball a bunch at the herd. He, he didn't have a – he only played two games. He didn't have a great showing in Oshkosh. I think one was home and one was road. But um, the shooting splits weren't great. But he still averaged seven and a half rebounds and four assists per game. So you still saw, I think, the good. And he had some tremendous – uh, blocks and dunks as well so that that stuff is always fun and a more open a, a smaller court environment the athleticism really shined through even more but I think overall in the seat on the whole Andre Jackson Jr. had about a, as good of a rookie season as you can have being again 36th overall pick 
a draft the Bucks were going into with only the last pick, and and hopefully we have time to talk about Chris Livingston, who I'm uh, maybe higher than anyone on. We got I'm to. A Chris oh, Livingston, no. true believer. Second highest. Oh, oh, we can compete about it. I I, I keep talking about the Utah game. Like I, I've said it so many times uh, that Chris. Uh, I think we'll get the, we'll get there. Uh, Andre Jackson Jr. Um, I'm I think I'm just really high on on what he can do. My biggest qualm with him is not the fouls. It's not the shooting. Just dunk the basketball. Th- yeah. There's so many possessions where he drives me crazy. You are a 99th percentile NBA athlete, according to Sam Vecini, someone who really knows. This isn't just yeah. me, you know, putting a number out there. And he will be around the rim all the time, and you just see him like passing out to Brooke Lopez. It's like, I love Brooke Lopez. Just dunk. Just dunk the basketball. And that's the number one. I literally think the Bucks this offseason, I mean, I put in the work everywhere else, should just have days where he just gets locked in a gym and they just make him dunk and make him drive to the rim. It's like you're so – he's not a bad finisher either. Like that's the thing that – it's not like, you know, Dante in some of his early years was really just not – and obviously wasn't, wasn't as athletic either, but wasn't a good finisher. So it's like, okay, maybe you make some decisions based on that. I mean, Ajax can just go and, and easily – it's not like he's a bad dunker. I mean, he's he had some insane dunks, mostly putbacks. Yeah, but it's like you just have to bridge the gap of you can do that with the ball in your hands too. It doesn't have to be floating there above the rim for you. Um, but I think that's that's an adjustment he should be able to make. And I think it's part of it is he is just a natural passer. He's such an interesting player. He's not a clean fit. But I mean, I think there's like this desire to okay, the Bucks need to find their Derek Jones Jr. And I'm actually working on a project about this now. They might have him. I mean, they might really. I mean, the way Andre Jackson Jr. has played, he might just be one of those guys right now, and certainly next season after his first full NBA offseason and you know, working with the Bucks staff some more. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything he can't do. And I'm really excited to see how he progresses going forward. Is I mean, I think he's got the best shot of these guys to start next season and beyond and certainly be a rotation player given what he showed in the playoffs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or the resources to hire. So LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. Post your job for free on LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnMBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnMBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So that last piece was what I was was going to bring up until we transitioned to, to the guy that you and I are, are pretty high on um, is I'm not sure what his position is. And I don't know, like, that's not a bad thing. Uh, I hesitate to throw out the name because of the connotations that come with it. But in many ways, his role, as I've mentioned before, has kind of reminded me of Ben Simmons, where he can handle the ball. And as we've seen, the Bucs need more guys that can handle the basketball. Um, But he seems more comfortable on bigger guys. Not that he can't defend smalls. We've seen that. Uh, But as you mentioned, that Derek Jones Jr. comp, I think his wingspan is around 6'11", that he he can hold up with his physicality, too. So I think he is a very positionless player. And I mean that in a good way. And I, I'm very curious to see how they use him. As you mentioned, if he's a starter, if you start him alongside Giannis, knowing, look, we should have scoring from Dame and Chris and Giannis that we need defense, which is why I think a lot of us thought, is this guy going to crack the ro- the starting lineup last year mm-hmm. because of that? So he's, he's very interested in that sense to me is how do you deploy him defensively? And I, I think it's pretty clear. Doc loves him. So an off season and training camp with Doc Rivers, I, I think is is only going to enhance what we saw this past season. Yeah, I think the fouls are always the big one with him. I agree with you. I think he's better at defending bigs, but I don't think 
in a way that you need to put him in that box, right? Like I, I think I've seen some hesitation in the idea that he could start because like, what if you need him to guard a two guard? And I, while I don't think that's ideal, give him that matchup and see what he can learn. So he's athletic enough. He's long enough. I mean, look at these playoffs. Like I, I, PJ Washington is not a player you'd look at and go, yeah, you want him guarding, you know, Shea Gilgis Alexander or players of, of that nature. He's done a great job. Like if you can be physical without fouling and just be long and quick enough, it's hard to score on you. And I almost wonder, like, one of my takeaways is playoffs. And we're about to do a pod on this. It's like, do you need the elite defenders or do you just need, like, athletic players who are big? And can that make up for it if you don't have the Drew Holiday on your team? Because we're seeing some of these playoff teams play amazing defense. The Mavs are an easy and obvious one. But, like, these guys are not – no one was like Derek Jones Jr. is going to be yeah. amazing. Is that a veteran's no, minimum? Nikhil Alexander-Walker was a throw-in. Yeah, in the trade. Like, but but they're athletic, they're long, they get in the way, and, and you know you can get away with a little bit more in the playoffs. And it makes it really hard to score. If you're just like, okay, I have a step on him, but his arm is still in my face, that's very helpful. Like size matters is another big thing with the NBA this season, I think. Um, so yeah, I think Andre Jackson Jr. is not not a player I want to put in a box in any aspect. I, I certainly see the Ben Simmons of it all. I think he'll probably never, at least not for the foreseeable future, have the ball in his hands enough to be yeah. fully there. But the skill set he has, I mean, it's really intriguing. Like it's it's about how can you fit him in right. And I think he's a much better player to have on the Dame Bucks than he was on the Drew Bucks because it just shifts. What can you put out there with the starters? Yeah, I don't think you need spacing at all five spots like you used to on this team. And that's been great. And he's shot the ball well, but he doesn't add spacing. No no team is like, we got to take away Andre Jackson Jr. threes. So I, I think the change had been at a perfect time for him. Your point about length and how just having bigger defenders might be able to bother. Like I think about the Pacers Nick series where they threw Neesmith at Brunson, where they're like, let's just put a six, six guy on Brunson. Like, let's just see how this works because they knew like they had to try something different. And Brunson's a bucket. So when you have guys who are really talented like that, they're going to get theirs. And your goal is to make it as difficult as you possibly can. Instead of them getting, you know, 30 on 20 shots, you want them to get 30 on 30 shots. You wanted to make it as difficult as possible. And to your point about the playoffs and physicality being allowed a bit more, I think that's when you see Andre's game. Like if he can really put it together in the regular season and he can be unleashed, quote unquote, in the playoffs, that could be a really big boom uh, for this team. And we got two more young bucks to talk about, guys. The other one is A.J. Green, who surprised me. We kind of mentioned it already throughout this show, but uh, the defense was a bit better than what I thought it was with uh, with uh, A.J. Green. I just assumed, like, he's just a shooter. He's just a shooter. Yeah. Um, and as the season progressed, you saw him moving his feet. You saw guys trying A.J. whenever he was on the court, and he's staying in front of him. Uh, in addition to that, one thing I saw towards the end of the year that I really liked because the scouting report was known at this point that – this man can shoot the basketball, close out hard, drive him off the three-point line. We started seeing him uh, get those the, the catch for the three, drive in and just take a nice little mid-range jumper when the defense is being a little bit too over-aggressive. And I loved that aspect of his game. If that mid-range pull-up can be in his game, if he's getting driven off the three-point line, that's going to open up a lot more for him. In addition to that, he tends to make the right passes. He just he just fits like a I'm going to do the right thing most of the times type of basketball player. Uh, and with Malik Beasley assuming that he's not coming back, given the fact that he was on a one year uh, minimum deal with the Bucks this past season, as you mentioned, there is a starting spot open for that two guard. I um, mean, AJ Green's a guy who on the roster you can kind of look at him and be like. Maybe he could be that guy who starts for this team. It could be Andre as well if you're looking for something a little bit different. But uh, A.J. Green personally surprised me a little bit this season, doing a little bit more uh, than what I thought that he could do. Yeah, I think that's the story of his season. I remember actually last Herd season, he played only one game this year because I mean, just he was too good, right? Like he wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to go down very often. But there was a game last season when he really wasn't playing at the NBA level at all. And I remember, you know, everyone knows the book on on this. You look at his bas- basketball reference page from college, right? Or sports reference right after the draft. It's like, all right, bunch of threes. Pretty big, for, pretty big. You know, some that sometimes it's like a 6'2", 6'3", guy who shoots that many threes in college might not hang. But AJ is certainly a little bigger than that, 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. But I, he made this like beautiful spinning midi last season for the Hurt. And I just remember being like, didn't know about that was in the bag. And then you kind of realize like, you know, he wasn't, an off-ball player in college. I mean, he was their offense uh, at Northern Iowa. So I think those reps kind of helped him refine the offensive game. 
And then defensively, he just moves very well. I think the best way to describe his game is he's just – actually, it's not for a shooting form. He works on very unique shooting forms, so he can always get it off. But everything outside of that, he's just very fundamentally sound. I think he's almost always – doing the right thing. He's rarely following. He's in position defensively. He doesn't usually get shook. I mean, it's like, I think there's this level of defender where they stay in front of their man, but you know, he's not going to rise up and like block somebody's shot. Like they'll get the shot off, but it won't be clean. And that's really, you know, that's a pretty good bar defensively for players who you don't look at as excellent defenders and, and offense, good offense wins, but that's the case for every player anyway, uh, as we've seen in the playoffs multiple years with great defenders who sometimes the offensive player is just better. Jimmy Butler, uh, flashbacks there. But I think A.J. Green is uh, is poised to just be probably the highest floor of any of these guys. Like I think he's already there. He's already a player where I look at and go, he's probably going to have a long NBA career because that shooting has sustained over multiple seasons. He can do it at a high level. He holds up at least defensively. He's not a guy who's going to get relentlessly picked on. Teams go at him sometimes, but I don't think he's a huge weak spot on that end. And as you mentioned, Camille, a good passer has made some wonderful passes when if he runs as part of a screening or like a dribble handoff action and both defenders, he's so good at rising up and hitting that pocket pass. And it, I think in the playoffs, some big moments where the Bucks needed a bucket, he kind of was able to open it up for a player around the rim and just get them something free. What I'm going to be interested in is for him next season and in this off season, I would love if he worked on, the anti top lock cutting that Duncan Robinson has done. I think Duncan Robinson completely changed his game just by being a devastating cutter. And that's one thing that we haven't seen that we just haven't seen AJ green much period, but we haven't seen as much of that from him on tape. And I would love if he worked on that. I think it's very difficult. Like I think the fact that Duncan Robinson became such a good cutter slash driver is a huge testament to him. This isn't like just something you decide to do one day and you can do it. But I think that makes him even more of a devastating option offensively because you know, you stick with him too hard around a screen or, or try to deny him cutting and he could just be gone at the rim. And then, of course, we already know about the passing, the middies and just the three itself. So really intriguing player, really high floor, seems like an absolute steal. And a guy you just imagine is going to be on the Bucks for at least the rest of this contract, because when you're around the second apron, you can have a real contributor on a vetman deal. Or remote. Same with Andre Jackson Jr. Mm -hmm. That's like gold for this Bucks team. Um, and the fundamentals are no surprise. He's, he's a, the son of a coach, and that's who taught yeah. him that shooting form to get it off over yeah. any of the bigs. And, and Doc has said this a number of times, too. Uh, what, what stood out the most to him about AJ was he's not going to beat himself defensively. Like, you have to beat him. So that's that's half the battle is, is just having a guy that's going to be assignment sure and, uh, and not lead to easy baskets on the other end. This next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. We all carry around different stressors. They can be big things, they can be little things, and sometimes those little things just add up to becoming a big thing. And when we keep them bottled up, it can really start to affect us negatively. Therapy is a safe space to get things off of your chest and to figure out how to work through whatever it is that might be weighing you down. Therapy can be different for everyone. A lot of our problems to some might not be that big of a deal, but it's important to get those things off of your chest because if it's affecting you, it's important enough, okay? Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's something that can empower you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, it's designed to be flexible, and it's suited to your schedule. So visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on MBA. Um, we've now come to the guy that I've long been most intrigued with from the moment yes, I, we first saw him, um, what in the G league and very, very limited reps at the uh, NBA level. But Chris Livingston, um, look, Full transparency, what drew me to him the most was just the sheer fact of what we've said year after year. Man, the Bucks need athletic, bigger wings that can hold up. So when you get a look at Chris Livingston, you think, okay, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the offense is still very much a work in progress, but you saw flashes from him. And when we talk about the size, granted, it's not necessarily defending one through four, but this is a guy that has the body to defend those bigger wings 
a near seven foot wingspan that he has. Another one of those guys, as we mentioned with Ty Ty, too, that was pretty highly touted out of high school, landed at Kentucky, didn't go as he imagined, and now you get a chance on him. Um, I don't know if it's next year that you would look at, hey, maybe he could carve out something like what we saw from Andre this year. But am I crazy that I have always thought there is something there with Chris Livingston? If you're crazy, then I'm I'm right there with you. We'll be at the the institution together. I remember when he came out, the book was like so raw, and and I was still like really intriguing last pick of the draft, like a player that raw. You just you don't know, and the cost of acquisition is. I mean, they had to give him a four year guaranteed vet min, so that's really. But you know, again, as we've as as everyone's gone over a million times, the Thanasis thing and a 14th, 15th roster spot, not really a huge deal at the NBA level. And this is there's clear upside there. This is a different different than that. But I actually thought his offensive game was more mature than I expected, given that being the book and the reason that he fell. And I, I just think for the, the pros at draft was like, he was 19 at the time. He is the youngest player to play for the herd this season. It's the only one who was logged as a 20 year old. He's 20 right now who played in Wisconsin at all. And like has just like this really like like mature big size body for someone of that age. Like most of these players come out skinny, especially these days when you know everyone got to watch Kevin Durant as kids. Uh, Chris Livingston did not, and and he plays like that too. Like he does the dirty work. He likes to do it. I've talked to him about that. He's like, that's just how I've made an impact, and I enjoy doing it. And you watch him, and he's always going for offensive rebounds. I think at the herd level, one of my most intriguing things was in the 16 games he played, he shot nearly 38% from three, which again, like expected that to be a rougher number year one. And I agree with you, Justin. I I don't expect him year two to be next season to be like, oh yeah, he's playing 20 minutes a game now. Like I think it might still be another year, but I do think this could be a season where he shows out at the G League level. Um, he, I, I think, has been a pretty mature player overall, again, given the age and just like, how young he is and, and what he's gone through in his career thus far. He seems to me to be about the right things. He scored efficiently overall, 46% from the field, had some great – he's a really – he hunts big moments in transition. He loves to get running in the break and just get to the rim and just knowing he's probably bigger than the guys who are between him and the rim and he can just get through them. And that's the kind of, again, the opposite with Andre Jackson Jr. That's the kind of mentality. I don't know if you can teach. It's really just like kind of just how players go about their business. Um, I, I think he's got a lot to work on offensively, more of, again, just kind of the decision-making. But he can come in and just make some big plays. I, I, I've talked about the Utah game where he played that second half and the Bucks almost came back against Utah, kind of in you know one of the really the, the lower points of their season. And he just kind of showed like how big that athleticism and that hustle is and you know what it's like to not have a player who's really trying to do that dirty work. I think Pat Bev kind of offered them that later, and that was a big deal. But, um, yeah, I'm really high on Chris Livingston. And I think it's a little tough to look at more than one year away in NBA terms, but that's why he's on a four year deal. Like you've mm -hmm. got some time here. If he matures and he's ready to play next year, I'm not saying don't play him, but I'm saying I expect we'll probably see him more at wherever the herd are playing, hopefully for my sake, Oshkosh, um, and, and able to show what he can do there. But I I'm really high on him as that future stretch four, which if he can get the shooting down, get the offensive process down, continue to improve as a defender, the rebounding is there probably get even bigger a little bit but i think i think it's really fascinating to have a player who you could be is just someday the pj tucker successor on the roster with that level of draft capital and i think chris livingston is that kind of could be that kind of player i i mean is mentally not is there right. as a player right now yeah and that utah game i think it was he and and Andre that were on the floor together for basically all of the third quarter that was when the bucks were down what 33 at halftime yeah. And you notice something where you're like, granted, it's the January game against the Utah Jazz, but man, there's something here. And the other thing is, it's albeit very limited minutes outside of that Utah game and a handful of others. We basically saw him for two minutes each game that he played, but he has an edge, right? When he's in there and, and the Bucks are down and it's garbage time, he's not a guy that's going to take anything from anyone. And that was evident too, that he just... As you mentioned the P.J. Tucker name. He just brings that edge, and that's something that the Bucks have long been searching for before and after P.J. Tucker. He had a highlight poster with the Herd on a player that I think they had been going back and forth all game, 
and he immediately got in the guy's face after and just talked so much <laughs> smack just directly to him. And I think he got a tactical for it. And he's like, I shouldn't have done that after the game, but it was an intense moment. But the great thing was the dunk was too good that they couldn't clip it as a highlight. So you just see he makes this incredible dunk. And like as the camera starts to pull in on him, he just immediately beelines over to this guy to get in his face and they have to cut it so quick after, but they couldn't cut it fast enough. Yeah, he has that edge for sure. That's what that. Yeah, Uh, which is fun to watch. You know, you got to control it. You know, as we saw with Bobby Portis right in the playoffs, that can that can go bad. But I do think you need to kind of walk that line and have some players who bring that, uh, especially as you want to be a physical defensive team, you know, certainly in the playoffs going forward. It's important to know where that line is and know how to just walk right up to it, maybe even tap your toe on it a couple of times, but not actually cross it. Like that's very important. And the Bucks mentioned that going into the Pacers series um, about emotions and how important it is and how you normally see more veteran teams are able to control that aspect of it. But the PJ Tucker comp, not saying that you're saying he will be PJ Tucker. Let's be very clear. Uh, yeah. But thinking of him as a, a small ball four um, is a different way to think about it. Because I think a lot of times you think of Chris Livingston, you automatically think, oh, he's a, he's a three. Like he he's going to be a three. But having that flexibility to play either forward spot, uh, that could be really huge, especially if you want to try to do some really uh, more versatile things defensively with your switching or just being more aggressive as well. So I, I love that what, what that could be uh, if that actually did pan out for the Bucks. So let's end it with this question here, Ty. We talked about quite a few different young Bucks uh, throughout this episode. Which of these younger players on the Bucks do you think is most poised for a breakout next season? <sighs> So I'm going to, so should we define breakout as like versus where they've been basically? Yeah, breakout like, in the yeah. sense of like not they're, they're going to get regular playing time, not a star, right. not like their right. most improved player or anything like right. that, but no, just somebody who can carve out a, a real rotational role on this team. I am, I'm just, I think it's the most boring pick, but I'm going to stick with Andre Jackson Jr. And I think it's, it's probably toughest for him because I think he had come the farthest over the course of this season, him or AJ Green. But I think he's going to be at a place next season where it's not, you know, is he going to play? Is he going to only get in the second half? I really think he's going to be like a very regular rotation player next season. I think you look at the Bucks' limitations in the offseason and, and everything and just clearly what they need. I do think Andre Jackson Jr. fits that. I think the year of NBA offseason is going to be great for him and hopefully being able to get some of these workouts with these guys. I just, you know, you look at, again, what's working in the playoffs, what the Bucs really need. I think he checks a lot of boxes. He's not a perfect player, but I think he's, we saw he's good enough to make do. I mean, the on-off for him against the Pacers was dramatic. I don't think it tells the whole story, of course, but I mean, they, they were really good in his minutes in the playoffs without Giannis playing at all, which is a huge accomplishment. So I'm going to be safe and stick with Ajax, but I do think, you know, Marjan has a, a case here as well. I think that's a that's a good answer. I would always lean a little bit AJ Green for myself, just given what I mentioned earlier about Malik Beasley most likely not being back and there just being an opening yeah. uh, at that spot with him being really fundamental and kind of sound. I could see AJ Green kind of sneaking in there as well. Justin, what do you think? Well, I was just going to say we we kind of touched on the mix of vets and young guys. Um, not to put you on the spot, but of really the three guys that we focused the most on that we saw at the NBA level last year in uh, AJ Andre and Marjan and that number 23 pick, how many of those are a part of the bucks next year? Uh, that's a great question. So I, I really, I shouldn't say, I think they will. I, I think I want them to take a center if they can at 23 and load that. Cause that's really, that's what they don't have at all. Right. Yeah. All the guys we talked about are wings. If even if big wings or a point guard in Ty Ty Washington, and they, they had one on a two-way, and Marquise Bolden had let him go. So I, I think if there's a skilled center there who you can maybe get in the building with Brooke for at least a year, we'll see what happens there, um, and, and be ready to kind of step in and just give them another mode that could have really used an athletic center in the playoffs. So I think if that's the case, they could all be around. But I think if if they fall, a wing player that they really like fall to them, then maybe there is going to be some sort of a move made. But it's, you know, it's, it's just tough because we talked about how high we are on all these players for different reasons. So as much as I said that, I think what's more likely is they maybe only add one player at the draft, do some moving around with those picks, and then keep them all at least for now. And then maybe by the trade deadline, you're making those decisions when you know, you're know you down to a year and a half on the Marjan clock contractually. 
But I, I do think I'd be a little surprised if they moved on from any of these young guys, unless there was some dramatic trade that they were a big part of uh, this offseason. I, I do think these guys are going to stick around at least going into the season. But that's a great question. And if they make two picks, then maybe not, because I think that you're getting to a lot of young players at that point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Ty, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a a two parter uh, covering all of the young bugs here on Locked On Bucks. Would you tell the people where they can find you and their work in case they want to? Um, after this, they have to want to hear more of what you're doing. So why don't you go ahead and let the people know where they can find you? Well, thank you very much again for the kind words. Uh, all of our work at the Eurostep Podcast Network is at gspn.info. Rohan and I are doing our regular Eurostep podcast, diving into all sort of off-season Bucks topics, of course, draft and free agency picking up real soon. So wherever you listen to this fantastic podcast, if you type in Eurostep or just go to gspn.info, you can find it there as well. Um, and yeah, thank you both again for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation and hopefully we get a lot more of these young bucks at the NBA level next season and we can look back and all feel very good about how high we were on them. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, for myself, Justin and Ty, we will talk to you all soon. Thanks for tuning in and come back on for more Locked on Bucks.